Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Pat Harker, President of the University of Delaware, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the University of Delaware's 2012 Distinguished Lecture on Diversity in Higher Education. Syracuse University Chancellor and President Nancy Cantor is a passionate advocate for racial justice and diversity. Her noted career has advanced these ideals inside and outside higher education, and we're absolutely delighted to have you here and welcome you to the University of Delaware. I want to thank the Center for the Study of Diversity and the President's Diversity Initiative for co-sponsoring Chancellor Cantor's visit. You know, we've been talking a lot about diversity over the last few years. I don't think there's any other issue that's rivaled that term, diversity, in terms of our attention and our actions. And that's because I believe significant sustained progress in diversity requires a long-term institutional commitment and the vigorous endorsement and support of the university community. It, re it really requires that we be open about where we are and about where we want to be and how much space separates the two. Diversity is a guiding principle of UD's path to prominence, meaning that every goal, every milestone, every achievement hinges on it. Excellence in this academic en enterprise without diversity isn't excellence at all. We've taken a multi-pronged approach to advancing diversity, equity, and inclusion at UD, and we have established a number of groups and initiatives. A compliance body, an advisory body, an administrative body, and a research body to help us become the university we want to be. UD's Office of Equity and Inclusion was created to promote an equitable, inclusive work and learning environment, to ensure compliance with non-discrimination laws and statutes, and to support faculty, staff, and students in any concern any concern they might have about bias, prejudice, harassment, and discrimination. And I want to thank OEI, the entire OEI, and Director Becky Fogarty for the strong support the office is providing UD and its people. The Diversity and Equity Commission was created to advise the university's leadership as we evaluate and prioritize diversity initiatives, to guide and monitor institutional change, to establish a forum for the exchange of ideas about diversity and climate issues, and to assure that matters of diversity and campus climate remain a central focus of our discussions and our work. The Commission gives UD's people a voice in how we achieve diversity, equity, and inclusion, and a voice if we're not doing it well enough or fast enough. It was the Diversity and Equity Commission that recommended we sponsor an annual conference on diversity. And we were thrilled that the inaugural conference held earlier this month featured keynotes by Chancellor Cantor's colleague at Syracuse, Vincent Tinto, and UMBC's President Freeman Herbowski, two of the country's best minds in establishing diverse, inclusive, and effective learning environments. And I want to thank the Diversity and Equity Commission and co-chairs Don Thompson and Nismat Shah. Two more initiatives were launched last year to accelerate our diversity efforts, raise their profile and attach ownership and accountability to them. The President's Diversity Initiative coordinates these activities within central leadership. PDI, as it's known, sets annual priorities and timelines around specific areas of action, and it works with the Diversity and Equity Commission to gather data, the data we need, to guide institutional change. PDI has established grants for faculty, staff, and student-led efforts to build a more inclusive campus, which has generated some incredibly thoughtful collaborative proposals and has been essential to engaging the entire UD community in this critical effort. And I want to thank PDI Director, sitting right over here, Maggie Anderson, for her leadership. And finally, the Center for the Study of Diversity is the academic arm of our diversity efforts. The Center provides the research base for what works with regard to diversity and why diversity works. And because the Center is research in action, it will show us how to implement the best most effective strategies here at UD. The center's research deals in specific diversity-related problems, how to improve the recruitment and retention of diverse and underrepresented students, faculty, and staff, how to improve degree completion and graduate school enrollment among underrepresented students, how to enhance mentoring and development for minority and international students, fellows, faculty, and staff, how to be a model for efficacy and innovation. I am very grateful for James Jones for leading this center, and I'm grateful that James is with us today, eager to introduce our distinguished guest. James. Uh, 
Good afternoon and welcome. I'm very glad to see you out in the audience. It is my really great pleasure to introduce uh, today's speaker, Chancellor Nancy Cantor, the 11th president of Syracuse University and a longtime friend and professional colleague. Dr. Cantor is widely recognized for her um, commitment to scholarship in action, which is a view that the university is not an ivory tower, but a public good, an anchor institution that collaborates with partners from all sectors of the economy and community to more effectively serve the needs of society. This dedication and commitment is unwavering, unyielding, and inspiring. They say if you're going to talk the talk, you gotta walk the walk. Though small of stature, Dr. Cantor is walking tall as a visionary and effective leader of diversity and public engagement in higher education. Her efforts at Syracuse University on behalf of her scholarship in action vision are legendary and trendsetting. As chancellor, she has pursued cross-sector collaborations in the city of Syracuse that simultaneously enrich scholarship and education and change the face of this old industrial city. Meanwhile, these local engagements in key areas such as environmental sustainability, art, technology and design, neighborhood and cultural entrepreneurship, and urban school reform resonates nationally and globally and demonstrate the interconnectedness of the pressing issues of our world. As a result of her efforts, Syracuse University was one of the first institutions to earn the Carnegie Classification for Community Engagement, a classification, I should add, that the University of Delaware is in the process of applying for. The Carnegie Corporation further acknowledged Dr. Cantor's work with their 2008 Academic Leadership Award. Her vision of the university's role as a collaborative partner that serves the public good was acknowledged by New York Governor Andrew Cuomo when he appointed Dr. Cantor as co-chair of the Central New York Regional Economic Development Council. Chancellor Cantor's leadership in higher education spans over 20 years and in addition to her current presidency, includes positions as chair of the Department of Psychology at Princeton, dean of the uh, uh, graduate school, provost, and executive vice president in act of act for academic affairs at the University of Michigan. She didn't hold all those at the same time. <laughs> and chancellor at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Uh, during her tenure as provost at the University of Michigan, she was closely involved in the university's defense of affirmative action in the cases we're familiar with of Grutter and Gratz decided by the Supreme Court in 2003. That Grutter case is the backdrop now for the uh, current affirmative action case, Fisher v. University of Texas, that was argued earlier this month before the Supreme Court, and Chancellor Cantor continues to be actively involved in defending and supporting the affirmative action issues related to that case. Dr. Cantor is a social psychologist with a PhD from Stanford University. Her work focuses on understanding how individuals perceive and think about their social worlds, pursue personal goals, and how they regulate their behavior to adapt to life's most challenging social environments. You can see the extension of her scholarship the, uh, in the dynamics of her leadership. The connections she has made in her scholarly life are the same connections she has made for public universities and communities. Dr. Cantor's work has been recognized by numerous awards and recognitions, including being a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, a member of the Institute of Medicine of the National Academy of Sciences, member of the National Academy's Roundtable on Science and Technology for Sustainability, Distinguished Scientific Award from the American Psychological Association, Woman of Achievement Award from the Anti-Defamation League, Making a Difference for Women Award from the National Council for Research on Women, and the Frank Hale Diversity Leadership Award from the National Association of Diversity Officers in Higher Education. She is walking that walk. Um, she's been on numerous boards and consultancies and is just a, a publicly engaged uh, scholar and leader and activist. We are truly honored to have Dr. Cantor with us today to share her vision of an engagement with Scholarship in Action for the inaugural Distinguished Lecture on Diversity in Higher Education. Please join me with a warm welcome to Chancellor Nancy Cantor.
Thank you all. It's wonderful to be here. It's a beautiful building and a wonderful campus doing amazing things. So let me begin by saying that it's not a new idea that the best way to tackle complex problems is to bring diverse perspectives to bear on them. But it's easy to forget this because so often our success stories focus on individuals. People portrayed as heroes who pulled themselves up entirely by their own proverbial bootstraps and defying the odds succeeded in solving some great puzzle. We name breakthroughs for them. We sometimes even call their findings laws, imbuing them with immutability. But as the late sociologist of knowledge, Robert Merton, reminded us, the discoveries of Newton, Faraday, Hooke, Kelvin, and so many others, scientists we tend to think of as solitary geniuses, were inseparable from their social context. Indeed, in 1961, on the 400th anniversary of the birth of Sir Francis Bacon, to whom, of course, we trace one of the earliest comprehensive descriptions of science, Merton pointed out that Bacon saw science as a fundamentally communal endeavor, dependent upon, and I quote, the accumulating cultural base and the concerted efforts of men, and they were men, of science sharpening their ideas through social interaction. We need not, however, look back centuries to Bacon for evidence of how social interaction spurs creativity. For example, in the aftermath of World War II, social psychologist Kurt Lewin catalyzed the creation of centers for the study of group dynamics, first at MIT and later at Michigan, that brought together scholars employing all the tools of the social sciences, as well as drew upon all the experiences of ordinary citizens in social groups as varied as families, clubs, schools, and whole neighborhoods. This founded a tradition of action research that, not coincidentally, attracted an amazingly strong new talent pool to the highly interdisciplinary work that is so well suited to tackling complex problems. I suggest that this action research tradition resonates even more powerfully today when the complexity of the problems we face have taken on unprecedented proportions. We have a widening chasm between the haves and the have-nots, and the have-nots are disproportionately women and members of ethnic minority groups. We have what many have called a cradle-to-prison pipeline instead of a cradle-to-college pipeline. Our public schools are widely viewed as failing increasing numbers of urban children in under-resourced school districts, and many of my colleagues in the rural districts of central New York and upstate New York would say the same thing. Environmental degradation threatens our future prosperity, as well as our health and well-being. Interethnic and intercultural conflicts are escalating everywhere, and our public discourse is no better. And increasingly, you might even say relentlessly, these problems are concentrated in our metropolitan areas, where more than half the world and 80% of Americans live. Grappling with challenges like these, complex and concentrated in our metros as never before, requires that we reach out broadly, not just across universities, but across the public, private, and nonprofit sectors, as well as our communities, to bring to the table the community of experts we need. Unfortunately, Universities hardly have amassed a terribly credible track record of successful systematic engagement of this kind. The impulse, even for urban institutions like Syracuse, traditionally has been to insulate ourselves as we seek to burnish our ivory tower credentials. When we have ventured out to engage our surrounding communities, our dominant mode of inquiry has been unidirectional positioning academic researchers as the experts who do things to our communities rather than with our communities. For us to have any hope whatsoever, then, in ta taking on those pressing challenges of our time, we must not only fully embrace action research methodologies that can bring the full breadth of expertise to the table in our diverse metropolitan communities, but we must simultaneously build our credibility in our communities by embracing a full participation agenda. So how are we to do this 
bringing together the minds and hands we need to to tackle the unprecedented complex problems we face in our rapidly urbanizing and rapidly diversifying world? How can we assure that we deeply embed in our public problem solving the experiences and expertise of those walled off from opportunity in our metropolitan areas by stark divisions of race, ethnicity, and class, among others. We need to build what social legal theorist Susan Sturm calls an architecture of inclusion with diverse perspectives, backgrounds, talents, and expertise across our institutions, encompassing, our, of course, our students, faculty, and professional staff, but also our community partners. This is precisely, I would say, the business, if you will, of American higher education. In fact, as you know very well here at the University of Delaware, and the President has just said it, diversity, inclusion, and full participation are not only not marginal concerns for our colleges and universities, they are mission critical. They not only contribute directly to academic excellence and the intellectual vibrancy of our disciplines, our campuses, and our communities, but they are essential for us to fulfill our roles, <clears throat> excuse me, both as anchor institutions in our communities and, as importantly, as educators of the leaders that our nation and our world desperately need. As thinkers since Bacon have known, diversity enhances the quality of our thinking. Confronted with complex problems, groups that can bring to bear diverse perspectives and interpretations can be very powerful and successful, whether they collaborate in the laboratory, in business, in science, in art, or in our communities where boundaries between disciplines and modes of inquiry tend to evaporate. As Scott Page, who as many of you know has done some remarkable experimental work in this field has concluded, and I quote, the ability to work across diverse perspectives may be the one big advantage that humans have over computers. We have certainly found that to be true in, in our quite diverse campus community collaborative. And you can see some of the faces illustrated here. And they are critical to tackling the issues of our city and our region in central New York. And I would say this is true well beyond Syracuse. Indeed, as more and more colleges and universities, private as well as public, partner with our cities and towns in ways that have both positive social and economic impact, it follows that diversity is a critical component of achieving that public mission of higher education. Now, none of these concepts is new to you here at Delaware. The strategic plans for the College of Arts and Sciences, the Center for the Study of Diversity's Home, and for the University of Delaware as a whole are built, as, as I can see, squarely at the intersection of faculty excellence and diversity, student learning and engagement, and local, national, and global impact. It's clear that new initiatives stretching from the life and health sciences to energy and the environment, national security and transportation infrastructure, for example, are helping to accelerate you along that path to prominence. And it's no coincidence, I would argue, that all of this is happening as you also stretch yourselves to become the more inclusive community you envision especially through the President's Diversity Initiative. So it's a special pleasure for me to be invited here, in addition to seeing old friends, James and Maggie, it's special pleasure to be invited here to discuss innovative practices that create structures, conditions, and leaders who succeed in promoting and valuing diversity. We share many of the same goals, and because of that, I know that we share many of the same questions among them, what does it look like when it's successful? And that's what I think we need to ask ourselves constantly. But before we begin to address what it might look like when it's successful, let's get to the heart of this question by thinking about what it doesn't look like. And here's a scenario from a dear friend, Virginia Vellen, who described at an advanced National Science Foundation advanced conference, and I know you have an advanced grant as well, many years ago, what it doesn't look like. So as Virginia describes, all too often, diversity is someone else's responsibility 
rather than each of ours. The provost says, I don't have the power, it's the deans. The dean says, I don't have the power, it's the chairs. The chairs say, I don't have the power, it's the faculty. The faculty says, there's no leadership on this issue. <coughs> Let's take that as what we don't aspire to be. And I would say that the deliberate dialogue you are having on this campus makes it clear that you will take a different kind of leadership approach. I'm just going to... So as we do try to take leadership, all of us, on this central 21st century challenge, a core principle for creating a successfully diverse campus community is to go well beyond simply providing access, beyond numbers, to build that architecture of inclusion, embedding diversity in the infrastructure, mission, and the core of everyone's work. Otherwise, as we all know, we risk creating a revolving door that will cause us to miss opportunities, I would argue, <coughs> excuse me, to reap the educational, scholarly, and public benefits of enhancing diversity in higher education. As we promote access and full participation, we must create a culture or climate that's truly inclusive, one in which a wide range of talents, interests, capacities are valued not just on paper, but for the contributions to excellence that they make. As Ernesto Martinez and Stephanie Freiberg, two extraordinary faculty of color, writing about the systematic obstacles for junior faculty of color in the academy, suggest there is often a profound incongruity between how we claim diversity as a value and how we do diversity in practice. And this is true for all of us. There are many ways to build this architecture, but we must make a fulsome institutional commitment to all doing it together every day. In that regard, today I want to concentrate on the positive role that the public mission of universities can play in promoting and sustain a sustainable and expansive diversity agenda in higher education. I would say that research universities like Syracuse and Delaware have an opportunity today to embrace that expansive agenda. We can do that by simultaneously maximizing the quality of our innovation and social and economic impact and our strong commitment to educating the next diverse generation of professionals, civic leaders, and citizens. Indeed, as we take seriously the intellectual capital, that we can bring to bear in collaborations in our communities, both near and far, we find that this agenda of civic engagement and public problem solving is entirely synergistic with the human and social capital agenda of full diverse participation. The more we do one, the more likely we are to create campus communities that are authentically inclusive, valuing a diverse expertise and set of life experiences more representative of the world in which we're engaging, and thus more likely to cement our recruitment and retention of talent as students and faculty and staff that span that world. Vigorously pursuing an agenda of innovation and engagement in the world beyond our campus will organically make it more likely that we sustain a transformation of our own campus communities becoming deeply and broadly diverse, that is, building that architecture of inclusion and one that will last. The synergy arises because we can't make progress on the challenges facing our metros here or across the world unless we both draw on many disciplines and many people and learn to collaborate across difference so that the whole is more than the sum of our parts. And when we do this out in the world, we build that fabric of society, that strong fabric of society, and constantly refresh it with civically educated citizens and leaders. It's as if we're planting the seeds for innovation through the kinds of good old fashioned barn raisings reminiscent of 150 years ago when Abraham Lincoln, in the midst of the most divisive civil war in the country's history, 
created land-grant institutions to do just that kind of collective work. It's really remarkable when you think about the Morrill Act 150 years ago. You had the most divisive war. You had a divided country. And he was committing to the role of education in building barn raisings, in building collective work. If we fast forward to a 21st century barn raising, then diversity becomes a methodology of life and work, the instantiation of democratic practice, not just a nice agenda for universities to embrace if they can, but a signature of excellence in an innovation economy. This point was made very clearly in an amicus brief in the recent affirmative action cases that James referred to before the Supreme Court, Fisher v. University of Texas. This was an amicus brief organized by Susan Sturm and her colleagues at the Center for Institutional and Social Change at Columbia Law School. In this brief, several of us joined with the National League of Cities to argue that we can't fix what ails metropolitan America, or for that matter, our world, without the full participation of our ever more diverse talent pool, the legitimacy of the leaders we produce in higher education in the eyes of the citizenry, or the productivity that comes when diverse groups collaborate across difference on shared problem solving. You know, we often hear the saying that diversity and excellence go together. Nowhere is that more apparent, we argued, than when we try to change the fate of cities like Syracuse, that on the one hand should be the hubs of our innovation economy with rich human capital assets waiting to be tapped, and yet on the other hand stand perilously stalled, trapped by poverty, wasted talent and brain drain, joblessness, blighted post-industrial environments, and crumbling infrastructure. This can be turned around. And actually, I see just those signs of progress now in Syracuse as we all put our minds together, committing as never before to full participation in public problem solving as a unified agenda for regional economic development. More to the point today, as colleges and universities in Syracuse and elsewhere take on this public mission, it turns out that we also make progress in building that architecture of inclusion. Taking seriously the public mission of higher education enables a diversity agenda to be central to our core work in ways that I've rarely seen because the value of full participation is so clearly integral to success in this arena. The work just can't be done without it. Yet when this work gets underway in full throttle, three aspects of the value of diversity become stunningly clear. Diverse groups do better work than homogeneous groups. There's substantial talent in our communities otherwise hidden from view. And so many of us lack the skills of and appreciation for working across difference. And without this social intelligence, no degree of expertise or innovation will ensure our collective prosperity. In other words, we quickly learn in this work that no 21st century barn gets built alone. And despite the myth of American individualism, it never did. In this regard, I want to take the rest of my time today to briefly illustrate through a few examples how this is unfolding in Syracuse, an older industrial city, as James said, in the midst of revitalization and economic development, with an eye towards the value that this public mission brings to Syracuse University's diversity agenda. Ours is a very broad civic engagement and anchor institution agenda, spanning many of the key pressing issues of our community and region, from failing schools to remediation of a Superfund site to spurring student entrepreneurship to reversing the brain drain. As a snapshot today of this broad agenda, I'll focus on the deep and broad way in which we've collaborated with a diverse community of experts in one of our most historic and challenged neighborhoods, the near west side of Syracuse, and across the city school district. The value of building diverse communities of experts and the range of two-way benefits 
are nowhere more evident for us than in the Near West Side, where we are working as members of an exceptionally broad coalition of partners. This neighborhood is the ninth poorest census tract in the nation, and in many ways represents the future of our metropolitan regions. An old industrial neighborhood, it's been nearly hidden from view by a dense row of abandoned warehouses and ugly railroad trestles. It faces challenges found in many urban communities across our nation and indeed the world, including high rates of crime, environmental degradation, illiteracy, poor health, and joblessness. It, almost has, it also has almost no political clout. In recent decades, only a tiny percentage of residents have ever turned out to vote, though we hope that will change this election as the neighbors have engaged a major voter registration drive, as you can see in the cover of the coalition's magazine, Vox, Latin for voice, where you see the voter registration uh, material that's in here. As this suggests, the Near West Side is also a place of considerable strengths and vast possibilities. It's a multiracial, multiethnic community with a socially active Roman Catholic church. For those of you from the 60s who remember the Berrigans, this is the Berrigan Family Church. A supermarket, and it welcomes all sinners, as you see there. A supermarket run by the same family for three generations, a nucleus of artists living and working in the neighborhood, grandmothers with long memories and deep connections, children eager to participate, and an amazingly strong culture of neighborliness. Five years ago, a group of residents joined with us and with foundations, businesses, not-for-profits, our School of Architecture led the way with our New York State Center of Excellence in Energy and Environmental Systems. And officials in the state and city government got with us to create the Near West Side Initiative, a 501c3 nonprofit organization to rewrite the story and the future of the community. It was the kind of barn raising collaborative approach I'm advocating to you today. Instead of setting up a command and control model directed exclusively by university experts, the initiative adopted a collaborative model, asking participants to meet for consultation and discussion and move towards a common goal. Although the process can be loud and messy, and I really mean that, the result has been an environment that allows, inspires, creates, and sustains a host of innovative and successful collaborations of experts of all sorts. Its structure is one form of the architecture of inclusion for participation. There's plenty of talking, even yelling across difference, that provides an extraordinary education for all involved, certainly for our students, but also for our faculty and community partners alike. Many of SU's strongest disciplines are now deeply involved in collaborations catalyzed by this initiative. Architecture, education, public humanities, art and design, green technology, entrepreneurship, disability law, public policy, information studies, public health and nutrition, public communications and writing, to name just a few. And I give you that long list and it could be even longer just to give a sense of how rich and broad these kinds of initiatives become and really what it means to say that publicly engaged scholarship can be at the heart of the academic mission of an institution. The diversity of the voices in the Near West Side shines through in the excellence of the creative problem solving going on every day now in this neighborhood. For example, in one of the earliest projects, SU students in an architecture studio interviewed and photographed some of the Near West Side residents who were told their stories. And these stories then became the fodder, if you will, for a Near West Side Initiative international design competition from the ground up to design energy efficient, affordable homes in the neighborhood. And the wisdom of neighbors like Mary Alice Smothers who had told our architecture students, ask us, we lay our heads down here at night, deeply informed and shaped the winning designs from really a remarkable array of world-renowned architects. This is the cranes when they went up, for the, up from the ground up, putting up these houses, these amazing designed houses, were the first cranes in this neighborhood for 40 years. 
Doing this work together, crossing boundaries of experience, expertise, culture, and generation, is not only empowering for the residents of this remarkable neighborhood, it's absolutely essential to the quality of the public scholarship and public work of the whole community of experts involved in this initiative. That is, we see this direct connection between diversity and quality very clearly played out. And we see it played out every day now in the courses that are regularly taught between SU faculty members and residents of the Near West Side. For example, Syracuse photographer, educator, and artist Steve Mann regularly mixes students from SU and students from the Syracuse Public Schools in his photography and literacy courses, and they produce the most amazing gallery exhibits of their self-portraits and narratives for the Link Gallery that we run at what is now our downtown design center, one of the abandoned warehouses in the area. Through their work, we literally get new eyes for each other and an empathy of mind that is so impactful, it changes perspectives forever. An authentic, on-the-ground immersion in the value of difference and the power of connection. These exhibitions also teach an unforgettable lesson about the hidden talent right in our midst. So much so that when the Annie e. Casey Foundation asked us what they could support to create educational opportunity as part of the Near West Side Initiative, we proposed and they funded a project called Learning Lots, in which high school students with aspirations to study art and design in college teamed up with our faculty to produce exhibits in the vacant lots all across the neighborhood. And as they did this, the students simultaneously perfected their college application portfolios. Hidden talent and educational dreams came to light in this cross-generational collaboration that raised the spirits and celebrated the vibrancy of this urban neighborhood. Now, one of the most striking benefits of working so deeply and broadly in a coalition like the Near West Side Initiative is that the groundwork is laid rather naturally, much more naturally than we do often on campuses, for cultivating the next diverse generation of talent, both in terms of the civic and educational skills afforded to our university students and the pathways to educational opportunity for the often hidden talent in our communities. When the spaces in a neighborhood like the Near West Side become quite literally transformed into hubs of cross-generational, cross-cultural, cross-disciplinary activity, then our metros turn into real geographies of opportunity, where dreams and aspirations have a real chance of turning into reality as social capital is shared and built. On the Near West Side, we're building this social capital along with the physical capital for the neighborhood. Two powerful university community collaborations have, for example, taken seed in another newly renovated but once abandoned warehouse, the Lincoln Building. One of these is La Casita, a vibrant cultural, artistic, and educational center committed to promoting and documenting the arts and culture of central New York's very very fulsome Latino, Latina, and Latin American community through collaborative programming in the visual and expressive arts, education, and community activism. The other is Say Yes to Education, a partnership between Syracuse University, the Syracuse City School District, the Say Yes to Education Foundation, the Syracuse Teachers Association, and numerous other organizations that is built around the premise that the achievement gap common in inner city school districts like Syracuse is a function mainly of an opportunity gap that can be closed if we all work together. Say Yes Syracuse provides vital support and rich opportunities to all 21,000 students in the district and their families. These include free after school programs and summer camps, school-based physical and mental health clinics, academic and family counseling, free legal aid for families of any family that has a child in the district, tutoring and college advising every step of the way. Students who attend the 10th, 11th, and 12th grades and graduate from a public high school in the city are also eligible for tuition scholarships if they're admitted 
to any one of 27 private SAYES compact colleges or a SUNY CUNY system campus. So far, and this is only about four years really on the ground, nearly 2,000 SAYES students have enrolled in two and four year colleges since 2009, including 157 now enrolled at, at Syracuse. SAYES Syracuse is a broad ranging collaboration, similar in form really to the Near West Side Initiative bringing students and faculty from SU directly into the district in comprehensive teams with experts of all kinds, from legal and health experts to classroom teachers, the mayor and county executive, corporate leaders, residents across the district, faith leaders in the community, and more. It provides a broad platform to unite all the many engagements with the Syracuse City School District that we've traditionally had, but now they're united into a powerful vehicle for change. And our students and faculty from disciplines across campus are literally traveling the district, sometimes quite literally, as in the case for the mobile digital art studio bus, M-Lab, that you see up here that provides a much needed space for artistic expression and technology education on the go for all the schools in Syracuse. Once again, it's important to note that this work not only changes the lives of our next generation college going students in Syracuse, it also constitutes frontline expertise for all our SU students as they fine tune the much needed skills of civic engagement, leadership and collaborative problem solving in a setting in which, and this is the key point, diversity is built right into the landscape of experience. We see this two-way street of educational benefits in so many corners of Say Yes, but, but perhaps nowhere so vividly demonstrated than in the curriculum on intergroup dialogue called Cultural Voices that one of our faculty members, Gretchen Lopez, has created jointly with a 10th grade English teacher in Nottingham High School in the district. This curriculum for structured dialogue across race and ethnicity and youth participatory action research is modeled after our on-campus intergroup dialogue curriculum that's part of a nine institution study led by Pat Gurn at the University of Michigan. But in the school-based one, not only have we seen positive civic engagement and academic outcomes, importantly, for youth in the district through this work, but the students have kept it going with a very successful after school club called Spotlighting Justice in which they turn their newly empowered voices into action in efforts to change the culture within their own school community. And there's nothing quite like seeing high school students empowered with that voice. Students in the club identify arenas of conflict, mistrust, and miscommunication within the school setting, and then fine tune their own skills of collaboration and leadership in designing actionable interventions. As all of this work is in collaboration with our own students and faculty, the impact translates readily back on campus as we all work to leverage diversity by learning how to better talk across difference. In fact, when we engage our students and faculty and professional staff in deep and broad ways in our communities, such as in the Near West Side Initiative and Say Yes to Education Syracuse, and when our scholarship affects not only the community but also resonates with similar challenges seen elsewhere, the value of diversity is made powerfully clear. This occurs in, the way, in ways that can be transformative and reverberate to change our institution too. When we educate in the world, for the world, as we often say, we build authentic context for speaking across difference and for valuing different perspectives and for breaking boundaries of race and ethnicity, culture, class, and nationality in our own institutions as well as in our larger communities. We start doing diversity more routinely as we do our work. Nonetheless, doing diversity as a natural outcome of civic engagement and innovation doesn't imply that we can forget to promote it on campus every day in a deliberate way. We still need people with knowledge, influence, and credibility placed in roles where they can watch over and reward both the public scholarship we value 
and the people who do it. These organizational catalysts, as Susan Sturm calls them, and I quote, must be able to instill hope and trust in groups that have become skeptical about the possibility of change. And there's an interesting parallelism there to the work that was done in the Near West Side to get hope and trust back in that neighborhood through this collaborative engagement. At SU, for example, it's critical that many of our deans are women and or of color, that our provost includes diversity with a broad definition as part of the evaluation of deans, and that we have a new position, Senior Vice President for Human Capital Development, reporting directly to me, integrating the academic and business professional sides of the house, and led by Cal Alston, a philosopher of education and former senior associate provost. Valuing and supporting the public mission of our institution is directly in her portfolio as she thinks deliberately about the diverse human capital in our own institution. That is, engaging purposely beyond our campus helps us to think more expansively about our faculty, who they are and what they do. For example, at Syracuse, as we began systematically working in these cross-sector partnerships and in neighborhoods with residents, we established a new position of community geographer, a faculty member then who used GIS to map community assets and challenges and shares this work with community partners. Now she began as a professor of practice in the Maxwell School and now has transitioned into a tenure track line as the centrality of her engaged scholarship becomes more fully integrated into the work of the university. And that's a progression we want to see happening a lot. The same progression has occurred in our industry partnerships. As collaborators from industry, often a surprisingly diverse group, including many more women in STEM fields, for example, than we see on many campuses, become an integral part of our campus community. This has certainly been true in our fulsome collaboration on global enterprise technology with J.P. Morgan Chase, which I know you know well from your own work together at Delaware. The JPMC partnership has not only engaged their experts as faculty at Syracuse, but also given our students and faculty diverse exposure to the diverse workforce that runs the complex world of large-scale enterprise across the globe. Another example is the design of our NSF Advance Grant, and I know that you have one, for women in STEM, through which we're building what we call an inclusive connective corridor with industry. And we hope host several notable interdisciplinary research centers and industrial partners are both on campus and in the region of Syracuse. These provide, again, ready-made opportunities for extensive networking and flexible contexts that support research and seed innovation, and at the same time model a diverse landscape of participation. Civic pedagogy and engaged scholarship and industry partnerships have all also affected how we support and reward our faculty in more particular ways. Working in tandem with the tenure team initiative of Imagining America, which I know you belong to, our university senate, finally, after four years of debating, revised the rules on promotion and tenure to acknowledge public scholarship, which may be published or presented in non-traditional ways. We want to be, to be able to reward, for example, those who create a patent for a new clean technology to be used in the renovation of old warehouses, such as those in the near west side. We want to support our education faculty as they create these novel educational methodologies as part of Say Yes, for, Say yes Syracuse, whether it's the mobile digital lab bus, early college high schools, inclusive schools of promise, or youth participatory action research dialogues. We're also attracting and keeping students and faculty members in part as a function of these opportunities for engaged scholarship and teaching. Nationally, many have noted that opportunities to feel connected to and engaged with underserved communities are predictors of both student and faculty retention, and that's just what we're seeing at SU. In architecture, for example, a field that has not traditionally been inclusive, we've seen a substantial increase in students of color. 
Many of us attribute this to more successful recruitment in metropolitan areas with diverse populations and to the attraction for them of being able to engage in Syracuse in architecture studios like those on the near west side. Similarly, we're attracting a very interesting and diverse group of professionals turned students in information studies and technology fields as a function of the exposure they get from our work with industry and in the neighborhoods in the broader community and region. And the same can be said for faculty who now come to SU, at least in part for its commitment to publicly engaged scholarship and collaborative, on-the-ground, public-private relationships. For example, the Dean of Education reports that Say Yes and related programs have been significant factors in recruiting and retaining faculty of color, and he has virtually remade his school through this. And our extensive collaborations in the region on environmental sustainability and entrepreneurship in urban neighborhoods, again, are being recognized nationally, where faculty will and, and publicly engaged graduate students will want to come and study there because they see an opportunity to turn knowledge into action to affect change in arenas of substantial import and arenas of, in communities that are similar to the ones they have seen and want to change. Equally important, the way we think about our students has been transformed. Too often, to me, it seems that as selective institutions, we're encouraged to put that selectivity ahead of the cultivation of talent. Yet when you see the children of Syracuse, and indeed those in so many metros across our country and in the rural communities in upstate New York, you become much more motivated to include rather than exclude. We're looking for ways to uncover, support, and reach members of the huge pool of young talent that surrounds us, especially those who've been overlooked before. Say Yes is, of course, a crucial piece of that road to opportunity. Another is our partnership with Onondaga Community College in our area, which gives qualifying students dual admission and a guaranteed transfer into SU, as well as predictive financial aid for the package they will have when they come to SU. This 2 plus 2 program is a big step for us forward in building the educational capacity of our community, but we're also extending it to geographies of opportunity across the country. Another step that has been very important to us is the Haudenosaunee Promise Scholarship Program, a partnership with our neighbors from the Onondaga Nation and indeed all six sovereign Haudenosaunee nations. This program guarantees full financial support upfront for any citizen of the six nations who qualifies for admissions to Syracuse so children and families can form that expectation of college affordability early on. Among the 177 current students who identify themselves as indigenous at SU, we now have 108 Haudenosaunee Promise Scholars. So although their numbers are small relative to the full student body, their presence is immensely valuable, not the least for the traditions and practices they add to our multifaceted community on campus and off. Similarly, as we engage in public scholarship about inclusion and disabilities, such as building fully inclusive K-8 schools of promise as part of Say Yes, then we inevitably think more clearly about how to engage students with disabilities on our own campus, whether through our new Disability Cultural Center, our Disabilities Law Clinic, or the Tayshoff Center on Inclusive Higher Education. Although Syracuse has always had a long history of pioneering disability studies, the intense engagement in our community and region provides endless opportunities to reflect on its importance and to work on campus to fulfill its promise. The same thing is happening in terms of entrepreneurship. As we work in the Southside Innovation Center for Women and Minority-Owned Business Startups or in the Student Accelerator at the Syracuse Technology Garden downtown, we again begin to build a two-way street back to campus. We see this, for example, in our version of what it means to bring post-9-11 vets, many of whom are coming with disabilities and many of whom want an entree into the entrepreneurial economy. And we have a very elaborate program for that. 
The point of these is not to give you Syracuse-based examples, but again to say that these are just instances where we're finding that what we do in the world is translating onto campus to build a firmer model for what it means to have an architecture of inclusion. And I hope you can see that our strategy for valuing diversity and fulfilling our public mission is to do them together. Valuing diversity, fulfilling our public mission, doing them together. Attuning our institution to be more in the world, addressing vital social issues, and acting as an authentic catalyst for change. In turn, as we raise those 21st century barns in Syracuse, engagements in the community create pressure for change that reverberates across the university, helping to build a sustainable architecture for diversity and inclusion, and most importantly, the skills and proclivity amongst us to talk and work across difference. We've come bit by bit, community collaboration by community collaboration, to know the truth of James Baldwin's remarkable comment, and I quote, if I'm not who you think I am, then you're not who you think you are either. We're all much more, and we're working on this together. And there's nothing quite like seeing that community of experts raise that 21st century barn to believe that diversity and innovation go hand in hand. Thank you. Yeah, um, I have to say I, I've had an immersion experience since we were sued at Michigan in that rhetorical war. And every time we feel like we're, quote, winning it, um, the same colorblind rhetoric resurfaces. And we're seeing that. We saw that in the oral arguments in Fisher. I mean, for, for those of us who spent our... our you know, four years of our life putting together the Grutter case and then hearing it in the Supreme Court, it truly, I gave a talk last week at Michigan entitled Deja Vu All Over Again. I mean, it was literally exactly the same line of questions and very much around the question of racial preferences. So one of the things that one, that we need to do 
is come up with as simple rhetoric as what you're labeling as the foes, right? So racial preferences is, of course, a complete misnomer for what holistic admissions does. And in fact, and we, I used to point this out to the press, and when I gave alumni talks at Michigan to calm the waters, um, I used to remind people that this country had an admission system of preference way, way bigger than, quote, affirm, racial affirmative action, and that was the GI Bill. And nobody talks about that as preference. Nobody. You could even go further and say legacy admissions if you want to. That's, that's a little bit more embedded in the culture of higher ed than in the public culture. But GI Bill, everybody knows and everybody supports. So one of the answers I would give is that we need to be able to succinctly create the compelling interest argument before it devolves into the, into the rhetoric of, anti, of colorblind anti-affirmative action. And when you can really create a context in which people understand the, the famous MLK line of, we may have come on different ships, but we're all in the same boat now, that's the, the sense in which, you, that's where you have to go. You have to create a sense that education is about what we do when we rub off against each other and work with each other, and that having a diverse student money benefits everybody. Then you can get into the nitty gritty. The irony of the oral argument in Fisher, and this was less true actually in, in the Gruder case, but the irony in Fisher is that they're actually advocating a much more mechanical, much more preference-driven admission system in the Texas 10% solution. And so whereas the lawyers for, for the Solicitor General and the lawyers for um, for Texas are trying to argue for holistic admissions in order to make the point that you want diversity within diversity as much as diversity across diverse typical categories. They are arguing for the sufficiency of the 10% solution, which is based entirely in segregate, only works if you have segregated, only works to get diversity if you have segregated districts. And one of the most interesting things in Texas, and a bunch, Gary Orfield and other people ran these numbers, and I heard them for the first time last week. Um, in Texas, if you do it that way, it works for Latinos, but it doesn't work at all for African Americans. So they virtually vanish from the classrooms. So my point here is not to get into too much of the weeds, although you know you've scratched the surface of something. <laughs> spend my life talking about and working on, but, but rather to say that I don't think we will ever have as compelling and simple a rhetoric as they do, but I think we have to embed our rhetoric in the fundamental notion that we are actually all in the same boat and that it is going to go down if we're not all at the table. My name is Johnson Payne, I'm on faculty in Black American Studies. <clears throat> um, and I, I do this for action research. I definitely want to thank you for sharing this experience. Mm -hmm. um, we need good frames of reference. I think we need having in regard to doing on the ground um, quality work. And, mm -hmm. and this is this is where we need to go. I have to ask, I have to ask, I'm curious. Um, any pushback, particularly from faculty, um, to the idea that, you know, um, that we have to, or, you know, I'm pretty sure folks are forced, on force, but any pushback to the idea that faculty are being encouraged to go into the community, and or any pushback from the community with respect to faculty and others from the academy? Yeah, fabulous questions, of course, um, tuned by your experience, I know. And um, so, 
On the pushback from fa on campus, um, absolutely. Um, and what's been interesting is the degree to which, despite our many efforts to make it clear that this is just enriching the possibilities for types of scholarship rather than favoring any particular modality or methodology, it is because so much of the support in the vision comes from me or from deans or from chairs or from you know, provosts, it, it is assumed that it's an exclusionary framework. Um, and we've spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to say that there are multiple ways to have impact in the world, to be engaged, to have one's scholarly work have social, economic, scientific impact. And one of the best things that we've been able to do is engage some of our most distinguished faculty members in making that case. So when Charlie Driscoll, member of the National Academy of Engineering, does, takes his sensor detective work, detector work and applies it to remediating the Superfund site in Onondaga Lake, and works with the Haudenosaunee Nations and with the environmental justice folks, it stands on its own. No one can say, well, gee, I guess this work, you know, really is only for those who can't do the real stuff, which I've heard many, I'm sure you've heard that many times too. So that's been one strategy. Um, another strategy is to just keep um, incentivizing this kind of work so that the voices that have typically been, in my view, unfortunately, on the margins now feel much more central to the agenda of the institution and can begin on their own to start pushing back, you know, and saying there's room at the table for many. Now, in terms of the community, and I could go on, we could talk maybe later, but I can, I mean, in terms of the community, what we did when we started this work, my first year at Syracuse, which was nine years ago, we did, as part of my quote inaugural year, a, a exercise, if you will, that we called Exploring the Soul of Syracuse. And it was purposely entitled Exploring the Soul of Syracuse, not Exploring the Soul of SU, although we had lots of work on campus about the history and legacies of opportunity making and social movements in, in our own campus. But we did numerous um, focus groups and conversations in the churches in the neighborhoods, in um, various um, not-for-profit groups, in neighborhood organizations. Um, and I and others would go down and would, and it is down because Syracuse in typical ivory tower fashion sits up on a hill and the, the downtown is literally down below. Um, we would go down, we'd sit and we'd talk with neighborhood groups and, and we'd say, so what do you need from Syracuse? And they, we'd have these long discussions and, and the fact that it, it was like a reverse RFP proposal process. So the, the fact that they were generating lists, and then we would always say, you know, we're not good at that. We, we won't commit to that. We're only going to commit to doing things we're good at. Because if we commit to things we're not good at, there'll be no sustainability of our investment. So the thing I am proudest of in all of the work that we're doing in the community is it's stuff that we're really good at. And so we can have partnerships that I know will not be one-shot, exploitative kinds of partnerships. And that's been very critical. And that really, um, that really made all the difference. Um, that church I showed where sinners are welcome, the Berrigan Church on the Near West Side, we had an amazing, what really began the Near West Side initiative was we had an amazing meeting at St. Lucie's that church and Father Jim Matthews, who there was actually a picture of him in one of the other slides, um, who's this incredibly fabulous tradition of activist Catholic priests, um, set the ground rules for that conversation from the beginning. And he said, look, 
first thing you need to know is this is a disability inclusive friendly church and if you're going to bring down faculty who only want to hand pick the kinds of people that can be involved in this effort you don't belong here and Every so often when, I, when I'm with Jim, he always reminds me of that, and he reminds me that there have been a couple of instances where we failed, <laughs> where we brought some classes down that were a little too much on the side of the expert model. Um, so we gave a certain empowering um, con control over to our partners um, in the community, and I think that's been really critical. So I think there's been trust that... It, and then there's nothing quite like the fact that, and I mean this not at all um, insincerely, I think it's really critical to this. We've raised over $70 million for the Near West Side Initiative. I mean, and a lot of that money, frankly, is money that could have adhered to the bottom line balance sheet of SU, could have made us look like we had bigger research budgets, for example, but we purposely put it in the 501c3 so that the neighborhood partners and, and all the partners in, in that feel a sense of ownership. So when we write those grants, they, you know, we, we certainly um, in, in get part of our faculty's time covered in things, but it sits in the Near West Side Initiative. And that's been important. Invite you to uh, reception. Sorry. <laughs> Pardon? Uh, invite you to reception outside. And if you have any further questions, uh, Dr. Cantor will be available to talk to you. Welcome and thank you again.